Right, so this is lecture 18, um, the week before the last week, final weeks. Uh, so what we are going to learn today is summary of everything we learned in this class. And most importantly, uh, we'll connect everything so that you know these are the stuffs you probably have um, learned and you can use in future career or other aspect of uh, uh, academic learning. So announcement, uh, group project, stand sending me draft. Um, the due, I know due is uh, next Tuesday, but you can send me earlier. Um, and slide presentation on Thursday next week, which is the last class. Um, but again, if you don't, uh, you don't have to do it on live, you can, you are welcome to send me the YouTube link. Um, and uh, then we can, um, I can share with the class. But I'll also give you some tips about how to make the better presentations. Um, also, feel free to share me uh, your slides before you start recording. That way, I give you tips and you um, then you can finalize the slide presentations. Um, learning objective, again, we just want to wrap up what we learn in this course. And I'll provide some guidelines for draft as well as presentations. And just one announcement, quiz four, which is the final quiz based on everything we learn on lecture after the final um, third quiz is a part of this quiz. That means you will, uh, this will be from lecture 12, 13, 15, uh, no lecture on 14 because um, that's the day you had exam. And topic covers mostly feel uh, uh, from landfill, how to design landfills, uh, what different um, layers do in the landfills the function of those layers, um, anaerobic digester, how it works, energy fundamentals, like you know how to calculate power or how to calculate energy. So those uh, those are the this uh, this quiz. <clears throat> so it will be released around 7 p.m. today. Uh, it's due tomorrow at 11:59 p.m. Um, so that means you have 20 minutes maximum because you'll have 10 maximum 10 questions, two minutes per questions. So you'll have uh, 20 minutes maximum to answer the questions once you open the quiz, like anything else. And again, this is just to reiterate, this is a best of three, best of three quiz will be part of your grades, not. So if you have, let's say you have done very well, quiz one, two, three, uh, quiz four is, uh, is like, a, even you didn't appear this one, it will not affect your grade. Uh, but if you didn't appear other quiz, you got to appear this one because that's the, um, otherwise you'll get zero. Uh, all right, so a little bit, uh, any question on quiz? We... Okay, so um, what we learn in this class or in this particular course, um, this is just the syllabus I want to show, like this is a tentative syllabus, what different days are. Uh, we cover everything except nuclear waste. The reason I didn't cover nuclear waste is uh, we're not really recovering anything from nuclear waste. Uh, before what we used to uh, work on nuclear waste is how they are being managed. It's basically underground injections. You, We talk about um, how they create this casing so that everything stuck inside and then they will uh, put them in, in underground somewhere. Still, we don't have a foolproof technology how to manage this waste. So this has been really like a um, unsolved process. So this is the, this is something that no other country knows how to do it. And we're just creating this stockpile and stockpile this waste. And um, at some point they have to decide how to manage them. Um, the reason it's challenging is because, you know, any location you want to, um, you want to put those underground, there is going to be always public outcry in that locations. Um, so that's another reason why this has been very political as well as controversial. So we don't cover that one, everything else we covered it. Uh, so I mean, few questions, I like questions all the time. So if you, if you said this way, then you'll know what you understood. At least you know what kind of major regulations are uh, for managing solid as well as hazardous waste. You have uh, uh, you know, the Solid Waste Act, uh, you have a uh, circla uh, which basically uh, circla as well as the superfund act you know so those those require uh, for managing uh, hazardous contaminated sites all that you just know the concept behind it 
you also learn a little bit more about different processes that could mix contaminant move through air, water, as well as soil. Mostly you'd learn about soil retardation factor and all that other aspect so that you can predict how far a contaminants will move through groundwater. Uh, so that means you, based on chemical structure, most importantly, organic chemical structure, you'll be able to say whether this is more soluble or less soluble, um, whether they can move in air or they are more likely to stick with soil. Uh, so based on the structure, you can predict a lot of those informations, mostly the functional group. And if it is metal, you also learn how, when they can be more reactive uh, based on hydration sphere or number of hydrated um, the number of water molecules that surround those um, ions. So then um, the second half, at least to some extent, you learn about different principle of remediation design. Uh, 3x ether treatment technology, we cover a lot. Air stripping, carbon adsorption, which is activated carbon, and advanced oxidations. Uh, so at least you know some design calculation for these three technology, and these three are the most common one. And then also you learn some in situ treatment technology principle like oxidations, mostly bioremediations and, and to some extent phytoremediations, but the concept are similar in the, how naturally uh, contaminants can degrade. Then uh, the second half after midterms, uh, week six, uh, we learn about municipal waste, how to manage them and what's their impact. And different type of waste we learn, electronic waste, plastic, and those, how do you manage it? How to recover some resource from it? And mostly, you know, these, these waste are designed or thrown into landfill. So you learn how to design landfill, at least uh, the concept behind it or principle behind different layer, which you should know uh, because that's what is going to be in the quiz. You also learn that you can harvest energy from uh, organic waste uh, by anaerobic bioreactors. Uh, so that could be useful for how to manage waste food as well as agricultural waste. And then also you learn different types of waste that can be created from energy uh, harvesting technology. Like uh, if you have produced water um, because of harvesting natural gas, uh, how to manage them. And for instance, you, you get most of the energy from coal. Uh, so coal produce uh, fly ash. Uh, you learn the consequence of fly ash as well as how you can extract some elements from that. Uh, so all these different aspects of things you learn, which give you just a overall idea of how to manage waste. Um, so there are certain other things you learn, something uh, more um, for your consulting work. Um, you learn how to use chemical equations to predict reaction byproduct. Uh, that means if you know redox equation, you know which one is more efficient or less efficient. Uh, you know also reactivity based on hydration sphere. Um, and um, the hydrogen bonding, all that aspect of uh, the point. You also learn how to use retardation factors to predict contaminant transport. So these are all, you know, you, all for, um, you know how to use, um, how to design the carbon adsorption bed or how many number of beds you can have based on a certain performance criteria. Same thing for air stripping tower. So all of those use some kind of fundamental equations of uh, contaminant partitioning, either water to air or water to soil, to design all these issues. And I hope you also learn uh, through your project uh, how to um, practical knowledge about different waste and how it impact us. Um, <clears throat> this is something I always value is learning to ask questions. Um, something I, you know, anytime you ask questions, it does um, help other people. And I don't believe that there is, you know, a lot of times we always, and as a students, I, I'm not used to ask a lot of questions for different reasons. And um, most of the time it, it's, a, it's the responsibility of the instructor to encourage that. And I believe that strongly because everybody has questions. It's a different story whether they, they ask that question or not. Uh, so we, our goal or my goal is to create the environment where you feel welcome to ask. So that's the reason we have Pia, uh, not Piazza, campus where uh, we have also in person, you should ask questions through um, chat window or any other way. Uh, but just know that anytime you ask question, I really appreciate that. Because uh, not just it helped me, it also helps uh, other students or fellow uh, students for you. 
And you will also learn how to write, you know, something that I, you know, I value a lot. Uh, any job you do, whether it's a consulting job, industry or academia, the differentiation between, different between the person who um, have more promotion versus other is writing. You may think that you, you, you know a lot of technical aspect of the work um, or you, you're very good at uh, understanding concept but it doesn't matter. You know, at some point, writing is the what most important criteria, writing or communications. Um, so you got to know how to write well. You got to know how to tell a good story because um, stories stick with people, not, uh, no, not the no fact. Even though facts are important because we are scientists, you got to still tell the story using those facts. Uh, so you got to learn how to tell a good story using the data you have. Uh, so that's very important, and that's why you are going to present in this class and tell the story uh, to your um, to your uh, colleagues. Um, so that's why I emphasize uh, you should uh, share your um, PowerPoint so that we can create that storyboard. Irrespective of what's your projects, you know you've got to also know there is a different skill to present that uh, materials. So we'll help you to some extent, give you some tips. So this is part of this class. And the most importantly at the end, um, uh, what we should learn is waste is a resource. Um, one product waste is also, it can be resource for other product. Uh, so our job is to find the best possible way to, to extract that resource or utilize it without harming the environment. Um, like I said, you know, something food waste is one of the biggest challenge in de developed countries. So we can use those uh, to to produce a greenhouse uh, or produce uh, energy uh, that will not only solve one problem, but also um, it can minimize greenhouse gas emission. Uh, so that means it, waste management start with us uh, to be more responsible, to be more um, uh, mindful about this practice. Uh, so if we all understand the concept, I hope and I am sure this is going to make a change at some point. Um, so this is just a, you know, one example, um, uh, like San Francisco, this is just a YouTube video. I just want to play it uh, so that you can, you can hear um, the, the how San Francisco city is trying to get zero waste. In fact, UCLA is trying to have the zero waste policy where everything waste produced is going to be um, used. Did you know that the urban waste produced from cities around the world is enough to fill a line of garbage trucks stretching more than 3,100 miles? That's a distance from Florida to Washington every day. And things are only expected to get worse. Thankfully, some cities such as San Francisco are paving the way and trying to change the way we think about trash. San Francisco plans to become zero waste by 2020, which is a pretty ambitious but awesome goal. And this is the main nerve center for all of the city's recyclables. This is where everything ends up to be sorted and processed. What is zero waste? It's an idea, and it means sending next to nothing to landfills or incinerators. In 2009, the city passed a law requiring residents and businesses to sort their waste into recyclables, compostables, and landfill trash. Recology is the private company that handles it all. When I started at Recology 23 years ago, the recycling rate was around 38%. Today, we've more than doubled that. So far, San Francisco has diverted 80% of its waste away from landfills, and its success has been getting global attention. Government representatives from all over the world visit this facility to learn about how they might be able to replicate what's being done here. What is the current method of waste management or recycling in your town? What we have a lot of in Denmark is actually incineration, uh, where you uh, burn the, the waste. Do you think that you might implement some of what you've learned here? One thing that we have heard a lot is uh, uh, the value of uh, composting. We don't do that a lot. Uh, so maybe we will go home and do more composting. San Francisco now collects 650 tons of food scraps, yard trimmings, and other organic waste every day. That material is brought here to be turned into compost. This is one of the most modern composting facilities in North America. Okay, so you can see a bunch of stuff here that people have thrown away. Mostly like wood here, a shoe, this flip-flop. 
Yeah, there's a. Uh, what's up with shoes? <laughs> well, there's seven billion people on the planet, so there's a lot of shoes. We're in a culture here in California where people are moving very quickly, and so people make mistakes. So we get the the things that are not supposed to be here, we get them removed right away, right at the beginning. After the waste is ground up and screened for plastic and other bits of trash, the organic matter left over gets watered and aerated. The piping system then filters out dangerous greenhouse gases produced by microbes. In about 60 days, the compost is complete and sold to local organic farmers and vineyards. How does composting help the environment? Composting keeps materials out of landfills. It returns nutrients to farms. It reduces the production of very potent greenhouse gases. It attracts and retains water, like rainwater. I mean, it smells like hell, <laughs> but it's actually very beautiful what you're describing here. You know, people's food scraps, which might otherwise be waste, comes here to essentially feed these farms and produce new Crops. Well, from this facility, more than 300 vineyards have received the compost and applied it to their vineyards. Farmers are using the compost to grow cover crops that pull carbon out of the atmosphere and return carbon back to the soil. And this is one of the best things we can do in an effort to slow down climate change. People have really heard a lot about environmental problems. They want to hear now a lot more about environmental solutions. How much recycling and composting is there in your town? Let us know in the comments below. And be sure to watch this next episode about a woman who already lives a zero waste lifestyle. Two years of trash in this tiny little jar. My values are having a really low environmental impact. I have to live like I want that. And so that's why I decided to change my lifestyle. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Secret Stories to see new videos every week. Did you know? All right, so that's a very interesting, um, as you can see the second half, uh, you should watch that video because it does suggest uh, that individual person decided that one day she's not going to uh, use waste anymore or she's going to minimize the amount of waste produced. And uh, so she started using different ways, uh, most importantly the container so that she doesn't have to use container which has to be disposed. Um, so see, uh, it's an interesting story. And most importantly, you know, you are the future of this country. So um, there are, uh, this is waste management is not just a solutions for problems. This is also an opportunity for us uh, to create a, create a solution that also pays people. So that's why there are many companies around now are growing on based on sustainability, uh, whether it comes to energy, or it's more about upcycling of materials. So this is just one such technology. You know, I, I think we should watch it just to see, you know, it's, let's see, it's only a three minute video. At Entray, we specialize in converting solid waste into clean electricity, heating, and cooling right where it's needed. Entry designs, engineers, and operates the world's smallest clean energy heating and cooling power plants on the market. They fit on the back of a pickup truck and run on locally available feedstock. Waste is all over the place. It's actually one of the biggest challenges that's facing humanity right now. From polluting the oceans to massive methane emissions, landfills are just not the way to go. Rather than sending that trash to a landfill, why don't we use that trash to generate electricity? Why not just do it on site so it really helps close the loop on the waste energy? At Entry, we specialize in the place. It's actually one of the biggest challenges that's facing humanity right now. From polluting the oceans to massive methane emissions, landfills are just not the way to go. Rather than sending that trash to a landfill, why don't we use that trash to generate electricity? Why not just do it on site so it really helps close the loop on the waste energy stream? Renewable energy is really the future of the earth and a healthy environment. The U.S. is the biggest waste producer in the world. Entry is offering the perfect waste solution for the states. We can go right on site, get rid of your waste, not have to ship it across country and not openly burn it. Rather, we turn it into useful energy heating and cooling. You don't have to take waste from one source drive it across the state to another place. If you can take the waste and actually process it in the location that you are, 
that's a tremendous opportunity to make the environment a much cleaner place. We typically start um, our operations with wood waste pellets, and then while operation, we mix in more and more of the regionally available waste. So what we do with that is we dry it down, and then we pelletize it in our own equipment, and then we mix in these two different types of waste streams and run our system 24-7 on it and generate electricity off of it. Through integration of solar and bioenergy, we can provide the right amount of energy around the clock, and that is a fraction of the cost with very low space requirements within weeks instead of years. So the fuel is stored right behind me in the silo. It gets transferred from the silo through the screw conveyor into the hopper. We have automatic valves and sensors that can tell when the hopper is full and empty, so it automatically refills. From our hopper, it'll get transferred to our gasifier through an auger. In there, it'll go through a series of oxidation reduction reactions at around 1100 degrees Celsius. It'll get gasified, and from there, it goes into our heat exchanger. After the heat exchanger, you'll have a combination of gas and ash. Your ash will get taken through the cyclone and deposited into this bin. From there, it'll get mixed with air and run through a combustion in our engine. The engine will power our generator. What we have is a closed loop system that generates energy and heat without all the bad emissions. When you think about um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or places where stability in the grid is an issue, this solution will really revolutionize the way that those places can operate and really the people there can live their lives. Now, dealing with issues are global and often it's very hard to tackle those and I think we found a great community at the incubator with all these like-minded individuals where we're thinking outside the box, we're going at issues from a very different angle than the typical industry norms are. And with that, I think we're changing industry norms, which is very important. Right, so that's uh, how many of you noticed the uh, the shirt has Los Angeles on it it's because it's a local company. Um, so again, you, you can see that many uh, companies are really using the waste concept to not just solve a problem but also create solutions for um, different problems. Uh, mostly, it's related to energy or um, um, or fertilizers. And most most of those solutions are uh, from organic waste. Right, so um, there are also some certain thing I learned. Um, um, this is a uh, in in you know in class we always have uh, now this is the I missed the uh, blackboard or whiteboard where you tie everything you mentioned we I tie right so that it just connects with students more. Um, this is something um, this is just from last year or year before you have to check. Um, but uh, there are certain things also I realize is that um, this is unique that we, this is the first time we teach this class virtual and we have all have challenges. You know, I have, you know, many of you connect with me and when you had challenges, I understand uh, because I myself struggles in many, many cases. Uh, so, you know, we don't feel, um, feel upset that you are going through a difficult time and you know, just, uh, we all are in together and I hope that we all uh, well, you know, eventually uh, things will get better and it's getting better. Um, and 4 p.m. class are hard. Um, it's like end of the, it's almost like dinner time. Uh, so back to back last quarter, this quarters I'm having 4 p.m. class. Um, back quarter, not, I don't remember, but next quarter I'll also have 4 p.m. class. Uh, it's just, I realize this is not a time I want to teach. Uh, it's, it's, we are tired by that time. So maybe you know, few class in the morning, few class in the afternoon is better. Uh, not entire quarter. I don't want to teach at 4 p.m. Um, so that's just something my perception. I don't know about you, but I'm sure you'll be by the time 4 p.m. is you are thinking of dinner, not not in another class. Uh, so attendance also goes down in this class uh, because of that at 4 p.m. Also, it's not required, so I don't really judge you uh, for not attending. Um, but I do appreciate that whoever can come and and so up, because it does help. Um, and then also uh, one thing that I say that uh, in all my classes I do, uh, is this is just one thing I do, I get instant feedback. You know, the day I teach well, or feel like I good, did a good job, I feel good about myself. And there are days when I don't do, I feel like, you know, there's something I have got to do. So that instant feedback process improved me as a instructor, as well as a person. 
so I think this is any times, you know, you guys ask questions beyond the class. It also, um, I feel better because I think you are not just trying to do well in this class. You are also trying to find a way to use the, what you learn um, uh, in other projects. Uh, so I try to help as much as I can on those aspects. Um, and again, uh, for this quarters, you have all done well. Um, I mean, I, I don't see anybody is failing the class or getting less than B. Um, that's something based on how the course is designed. If you have attended all classes, all uh, appear all the quiz, uh, then if you get some credits. And as I said, the, the, my uh, motive for this class as well as the, uh, the other class I teach is mostly project-based learning. Uh, so I do de-emphasize individual performance on the exams. I do emphasize more on on uh, on projects as well as learning from by working together as well as asking questions. So most of your projects are going to be ninety percent, ninety to ninety five percent grade, or uh, you receive that much grade. So it's very difficult to receive low, lower than B grades. But having said that, you should not try for B. You should try for A. And if you do well and eighty percent, ninety percent, or all of you get A, I don't really. I'm not here to judge you, right? So um, I'm not one of those, um, at least it's not my belief that I have to have only 30% people get A, you know, that's, that's a wrong concept. Uh, if all of you did well, based on my expectations, you should all receive A. And most of you are doing very, very well. Um, so I also know that I get emails that you have received a survey for this class. Uh, so whenever you get a chance, uh, please uh, fill out that survey. It's important because uh, uh, partly also you may receive another survey related to COVID. Uh, so again, anything you um, mentioned there is does help department as well as me. I do read all your um, comments, everything. And I do read before, the, after the exams or uh, after the exam, it's after everything's done. And also I read them before I start the class next year because I wanted to see, mostly I, I highlight the one which is negative comments, not negative, that's the wrong way to say. Uh, critical comments, uh, because I, I think, you know, every year I change few things based on those. Uh, so your feedbacks are useful to improve in this class. So what you see today's class is not what it was four years ago. Uh, so students like you who gave feedback, take your time giving feedback and uh, does help. Uh, obviously what goes right is also hearing those is important because that means I know if get validated that these are the things matters to you. So do give uh, both kind of feedbacks, um, uh, things that you like, things that you could have improved, uh, we could improve. Uh, so let us know on that. So having said that, um, there are two assignment. One is presentations, another is a draft project. Uh, so I wanted to give some feedbacks on those so that you know what to expect. Um, send me your presentation slides as a Google slide uh, so that I can give you feedback. It should not be more than 10 slides. Because 10 minutes don't spend, don't, I mean, you can make more slides, it's not a point. Because if you have just one picture for a slide, you can pass through different pictures quickly, you know, it's still okay. So it's not about number of slides, it's more about, uh, you should have enough content to present within 10 minutes. So if you have way too many slides, you'll just pass through very quickly, nobody will absorb anything. So make sure um, you have importance and um, good slides and spend good time on slides so that people observe on it. That's why send me the presentation file so that I can give you feedback on what you can improve and so. Uh, your presentation is on the last class on Thursday. Uh, so before you used to have students presenting directly in the class, uh, you have option to do that. But because of COVID, I know that some students may not be able to attend. So I didn't make that as a requirement. So that means you know, it's up to you if your team um, select you or you are the one presentation of your team. You don't have to record, pre-record and just come to this class on Thursday and present it, that's fine. Um, but if you don't, um, the, just send me the link um, beforehand on, on uh, the before the class so that I can, at least I see that and also I'll share in the class. Or we will uh, at least share the link if we don't cover everything. Again, evaluation criteria, I look for content for 30%, how complete your the content is. Usually that's not a issue. Most of you get 30%. The reason is you already wrote the uh, draft by that time. So you know the content well. 
uh, I also look for organizations, you know, how well uh, you, the flow and all that stuff. And storytelling is very important because you can't just come and just present something when we can get the, what's the main pictures, what's the message. Uh, so good storytelling is important. Mm. So that's based on all that I, I try to evaluate. Now again, I, um, I'm not a best speaker, you know, so I'm not expecting, you know, if you are a great speaker, I learn from you. So I'm not here to, when I write 30%, I don't give, it's not like I give you 25% or 10%, but it's not, you know, it's just a guideline that you should emphasize content organization and storytelling. And so when I say storytelling, a good story is told by having pictures, not lots of words on text on the slide. Uh, so make sure you have many visuals. Uh, the best presentation are the one where you have visuals, not much text. Texts are there just as a guide, but if you are speaking that and you are effective speaker, uh, or at least not accent like me, uh, you will be able to say very well uh, without having to write all the text. Because a lot of times I do write text because I know that if I speak differently or my accent is uh, uh, not, um, you can't get it, then um, then it's going to give the wrong information. But for you, many of you are native speaker. Now, all you have to do is just have a pictures and just one or two words. That's good enough as long as you can tell the story. Uh, so watch a couple of uh, TED Talks so that you can see, you don't really need much uh, text in your slides to tell a good story. Um, also remember, I know the story because I read your um, draft by then. So it's not about telling everything that is in the draft, but uh, telling the good story based on some section of the draft so that they know what you did. Again, more visual. Um, this is just a guidance. This is not necessarily uh, mean to be um, exactly how you should do. Uh, start with a hook because it is important for audience to get interested. Uh, for instance, you know, you have different problem, uh, different uh, type of project. Think of which way people will pay attention. If you say something, it's usually you know, something so simple or something so uh, can be controversial uh, that gets people attention. And once you have the attention, you can create these questions or uh, or um, can cross curiosity uh, so that people uh, try to understand uh, what's the real story, what you get, what you found, all that. So this is just an example, give you, um, again, this is by no mean, this is, has to be the way every project is different. Don't follow exactly like this, no, just give us, it, it gets a sense. Um, but important, you have to start with a hook, your presentation should end with a take home message, uh, because at the end we remember that. Um, this is just an example. Um, I'm not going to uh, play this one right now. Uh, this is just an example of TikTok. The reason I put it here that many there are many playlists in this. Uh, if you click on that, uh, so you can watch some one few of them just to see how uh, what makes it effective presentations. So that's after that. Uh, I just want to end it with a project draft because I know this is due. Um, these are the uh, common mistakes many students do. Um, the couple of mistakes people do is lack of references in the draft stage. In the final, that's not acceptable because I already gave you comments, so you, you'll most likely do it. Um, but in the draft stage, also a lot of people think this is a rough draft, so I don't have to put references. Um, that's why we have very first homework. We teach you how to search references in Web of Science or Google Scholar, how to cite them. So there is no point of not citing papers. Anytime you write a statement, for instance, you say that, let's say you said 90% of the plastic is, is waste, 90% of the plastic waste go ended up in the ocean. How do you know that? It's just you read somewhere, there has, has to be some, in, because it's very specific, it's a statement. It has to have a citations. Um, so look for sentence that has um, statement and uh, look for a couple of key, keyword from those and search on Google Square, Google Scholar or Google and you'll find some references if you just cite some keyword or put some keyword. And then from the couple of them, you, know, you can find which one is more appropriate and cite it. If you can't find a, find a study to support it, remove that statement. Because a statement without support is more likely you are creating opinion. Uh, so this is a scientific study. So you got to have references. 
And a lot of times also people, uh, many students don't cite enough journal articles. It's not like you're required to cite only journal articles, but you got to have some, given some effort um, because that's where the most um, scientific studies are. And you can obviously cite reports, government reports and uh, um, new channel, news articles, but those news articles are dependent on some reports. They are not, news agency is not creating that study. They are just citing certain studies. So it has its own original report. Uh, so make sure you find the original report too, if you can. But it's okay to cite um, news articles. But most of them by far should be journal articles, uh, at least the section where uh, it means uh, you are ex explaining certain technology. And uh, don't cite anything from unreliable source. For instance, you know, unreliable source means, you know, Journal articles are vetted, peer reviewed, so those are reliable. Um, um, typical, like New York Times, all that, LA Times, these are reputed. But if you think of, you know, some, there are in lots of uh, websites nowadays in, in on internet. Just because you find some, just make sure that website is reputed enough because I don't have a way to know it, but you know, look for something good resource, not something random, you know, opinion, somebody's writing blog. Those are not right references. Other mistakes a student do is they don't write topic sentence. Uh, that means you know it's very difficult to know what they're trying to say in that paragraph. That's why in the very outline stage, I write those questions or I help you write those questions. And so at least the topic sentence, if I read just the first, first two lines of each paragraph, I should be able to uh, know the entire story. Okay, so just pay attention to those because that's kind of set the structure for entire um, entire draft. So once you finish draft, just make pay attention to those. And then also see this, how the story is being evolved from paragraph to paragraph. It, does it connect and does it come abroad? So look for those in, uh, but again, I'll give you feedback. So if there are certain other things. And uh, this is, I think this is the most critical mistakes among all that I mentioned is you lack visuals. You just write 10 pages of text. Uh, you can have many opportunity to have visuals. In fact, those are the visuals you are gonna put on the slides. Uh, so you don't have to do double work. You can, you can put some other visuals in that report so that it looks balanced. And also um, um, you can use, use the same text, same visuals in your PowerPoint or presentations on Google Slides. Um, that's why I wrote, don't tell, show it. If you have to show that 10, let's say you say plastic is a big problem. 90% plastic is wasted. So a picture of plastic waste. That tells the story more effectively than writing plastic is a big problem. Uh, same thing, let's say if you say food waste, so a picture of food waste, as opposed to talking about it now in the slides. Uh, so it all, again, um, you know, there is too much. You now don't put way too much so that you don't have any space to write. And it has to have balance. Types of picture you can use is picture of a site. If you have a polluted site that is part of your project or locations, uh, floor diagrams, showing the processes. For instance, if you are doing some processes, taking food waste, doing different thing, you can create this is food waste. Put a picture of food waste, arrow mark. This goes to, let's say, pre-processing or whatever it is. You know. And then some of those goes to let's say anaerobic digester. So you create a box and all that stuff so that people can understand how you are, how things are moving from one to another, where the energy is being produced or what the output materials, how the waste is gone, gone from one uh, phase to another phase. Graphs, if you create, you have equations and you have data, create graph, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. Um, but if you have, let's say, uh, collected data, showing short numbers, put that as a as a bar graph or something, pie chart, and that explain more than anything else. And then uh, these are just examples of how you can, at the sentence level, you can edit your writing. Um, this is something you should do by not just uh, yourself, you should uh, check other writing, give feedback each other. Because writing is a process that you learn for whole life. Uh, Nobody is a better writer by birth. Everybody learn writing. Uh, I'm learning, I'm evolving. So I do understand that it's a process. But I expect you to follow certain norm. For instance, you know, these are the certain examples. Uh, if you have to read one 
um, book about writing or revising your writing, I recommend the left side, the one I has, I put it there, uh, Style, Lesson, Clarity and Grace by Joseph William and Joseph uh, Dijab. So that's, those are the two, these, these books is pretty, I, I found it very useful. So forever, if you ever, it has 10 chapters, very specific and only 100 page or something. Um, it has a lot of example. Uh, so these are the few tips you, you can use those. For instance, you know, any sentence, make it a direct sentence, uh, like, you know, instead of indirect sentence, like, you know, I am teaching, that's direct sentence. And I is clear, that's action verb. Um, teaching is action verb. If I say I'm doing the teaching, that's not action verb. Doing is the not action verb. It's, it's, it doesn't give you the sense of that. So these are the first, you know, write a subject that is character of your story. That's a plastic waste. Um, so that's a character, you know, just giving an example. If you start with eat, they, all that stuff, you know, it's very in, very hard to know what does that mean. Uh, so it's just an example. Again, it's not applied for every sentence. Just know that um, there are exceptions. But this is just a generic way of uh, revising your sentence. Um, most of the time when you write sentence, write familiar information at the beginning, more complex information at the end. The reason is when I read or anybody read, uh, we try to process. So if you know something before and it shows initially, you can connect that. And that makes it easy reading. And, but if you always start with uh, something you know, uh, known or new information, so it throw off us. You know, it's, it's, first we have to pause and then we have to connect, then we have to process what we already learned. So this is just uh, some reason for it. Um, then don't write too big sentence, um, uh, avoid writing too many uh, words on it. And that's why you know, avoid long introductory phase. For instance, you know, um, I, I mean, there are examples, just uh, don't want to say too much about it because it's just a simple rule. About long abstract subjects, about interrupting subject verb connections, which means that let's say I say, I'm teaching, I professor of UCLA, blah, 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 in teaching. By the time you say verb, not clear who is doing that teaching. Okay, so don't interrupt your subject between verb um, too many things inside. Again, these are just ex just a um, normal rule. It's not like you have to follow all the time. I just put it here so that you have some information to check, you know, just to see going back to visit. Um, um, this is a scientific writing PDF. I'm going to I'm going to share this one. It's not PIA, it's a campus where I'll put it there just to just to give you some idea of how to revise your own writing. Because writing is rewriting. You can write a draft, but it, it takes a lot of effort. In fact, many of the publications we publish, we write, takes a long time to write a complete draft. But once we write it, the actual writing begin from that. We rewrite, we revise multiple times, many, many times before we send it to the journals. So it's very normal for uh, going through this revision process. So when you send me the draft, make sure that all of you read it, all of you revise it uh, so that it looks uh, better. Um, so that's all uh, for the tips I thought I want to share. Um, um, but now we should have a, a few minutes of break before we come back and, um, and have, a, um, um, have a discussion about one example problems, which is a um, reclamation of land in Los Angeles Harbor. This is an ongoing project. It's not being developed yet. So that means this is, this is uh, not solved. So we are going to solve it today. Solve means we are going to brainstorm different ideas. And I'm going to share something we propose. Uh, but at least, you know, we as a class will learn how we can clean up that site. Um, so we have, let's again have a 10 minute of break. Uh, let's meet at five o'clock and then we can uh, discuss this. Um, but if you have any questions on, what we discovered just recently, you know, you can put on the chat window. All right, so I'm gonna pause the recording. All right, so before the class, we um, we discuss about that this one particular project we are gonna discuss. The reason I, I wanted to put this one here is that there is no such solution yet. This is ongoing problems. And um, this is the solutions we can apply. Uh, so this is a lim unlimited imagination. So we could we could design whichever way we want. 
or at least this is close to our home. Our home means now uh, from UCLA. So this is a site that you see is LA Harbor at different locations. Uh, many of those sites over here are used to uh, um, use for uh, shipping, loading, but nowadays it's not. You now many places they are not use, being used anymore. Uh, so there are different lots uh, which has those um, and this pre-contaminated with uh, mostly organic pollutants, PCB uh, or organic solvents, mostly petroleum pollutants, gasoline and petroleum. Uh, so it's highly polluted the surface. So that means uh, they cannot uh, design any big buildings and stuffs uh, or apartment complex unless they clean it. And unlike other places, LA, LA is pretty expensive. The, every square feet of LA is very expensive compared to any other place. So if you have like acres of acres of land here, which is not being used for this, what you used to be, uh, that owner is losing money. Uh, so that means if they somehow can clean it up in a reasonable amount of time and, uh, and money, they can recover that land or, uh, or uh, create, recreate um, or, or create different um, uh, real estate or other process there. So that's the whole idea. So this property is value hundreds of hundreds of millions because of space and the locations, but yet it's polluted. So only thing I'll tell you here is that it's highly polluted. It's very, very high concentration on the top one feet of layer. And uh, then the concentration decreases as you go down. And obviously it's faulty uh, because it's near ocean. Uh, the groundwater is not, uh, not obviously useful here because it's a kind of, um, there is no groundwater in the sense the groundwater is, is salty water or saline water. Uh, so now that you know all this concept, uh, how you can clean it up. So that's the whole idea. Okay, so now we, it's time to brainstorm uh, what you learn and uh, you can start giving all your imaginations, anything you think of, what we can do. Let's start with the first problem. You have very highly polluted, first of all, um, these are organic solvent, okay? So what treatment is uh, suitable to remove organic solvent or petroleum? What kind of treatments you could do? I see in soil, it's not groundwater. Let's put this way. This is in heavily soil pollutions, subsurface soil. So that means pump and treat is not the solutions, okay? That's what I wanted to clarify. There is no groundwater to clean up the soil that you need cleaning. So any volunteers for a clean up? Could you dig the soil away? Yes, that's one, one approach. So in fact, that could be one of the best approach is because I said uh, top one feet of soil layer is heavily polluted. And if it is highly polluted, let's say what other method you have. Uh, highly pollution means you've got to use either bioremediations or some kind of chemical treatment. Um, but that's very expensive if you have really high concentrations. So it could be a lot easier to excavate that highly polluted soils and dump it into landfill. Uh, so that could be one method. So let's say we dump, we, we take top, six inch up layer and dig it up and just put it back in landfill. That way you remove 80% of the pollutant. And there may be other way you can also remove, as I said, uh, you can destroy the pollutant by a certain method, like either chemically or some other way, but then it's expensive. And uh, so you got to think of that aspect, whether you can do any other way or not. All right, so next what? Let's say you dig, dig the soil top few inch. Now still you have, because if you if you remember, if you create a house or anything, you have to your foundation will go much deeper. You got to clean all those soils from pollutions. And these are, these are petroleum, so some of them can be volatile. That means you know it will it will come up. So whoever lives there, they will inhale those all the time. So that's that will develop cancer and all that stuff. So you don't want that. So it means that you have to clean up that sites to that level. So uh, any other solution, let's say we remove the top layer and then what's the different method we can use 
to remove pollutants. As I said, you, you're not doing it, so you don't. You have no risk for being wrong. Uh, so you can you can always suggest something very crazy idea. You could say that I'm going to burn the entire soil, all the gasoline there. You know that could be. You know why not? You no, know, just heat the entire soil and burn it. But that will be expensive. So that's the whole idea. You know, you say suggest a solution, then you find a way to. What other methods for removing organic pollutants? Would in situ chemical oxidation work in the soil? Yeah, I mean, even though it's not groundwater, isn't the medium? Well, if if in situ oxidation also, you know, when you inject an oxidant, it also reacts with soil, right? So it's not just the groundwater. So yes, in situ oxidation would also work. So that means you have to inject uh, all these, let's say, KMnO4, potassium permanganate, because it's not so deep, so it's, you don't have to worry about. Uh, Accessibility, you can just make hole at certain space and just pour uh, KMnO4. So it'll destroy a lot of them. Uh, so that means you have to calculate how much cost it will be for uh, the KMnO4 and what kind of the reactants will receive. Because you'll destroy also, you know, it's basically a bleaching the entire soil. That's what you're doing here. Yeah, so that's one solution. What other solution? So I, I'd assume that the, the carbon nitrogen phosphorus ratio would be extremely high like carbon. So if you were to um, fix that ratio, would that have any effect on the contamination? Um, so typically the contaminated site has lots of organic carbon, but not necessarily nitrogen and phosphorus. Otherwise nature would have degraded it. And so they are usually nutrient depleted. They may have high amount of carbon, which is the pollutant, but they may not have enough nitrogen and ox, ox, nitrogen and, uh, and phosphorus. So one of the solution, like you said, we could have to balance that out. If you are going for bioremediation, your goal is to inject these nutrients so that whatever the nature, natural microorganism, you give them some help to finally start decom decomposing or degrading it. So that's the bioremediation technology. So if you do go for bioremediations, you have to give them um, give them uh, nutrients. Uh, so all bioremediation is what technology. So if you think at the core, what they do, microbe, they eat that organic pollutants, right? So that eating, what kind of reaction it is? Even think of what we do in our stomach. This exactly they do. What what reaction it is? Is it a dissolution or it's a adsorption or what is what kind of reaction? Think of carbon. Go yes, go ahead, Emma. I think somebody else is going to say something too. Yeah. Well, as I said, you 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 you're allowed to be as imaginative as possible. Think of what what happens inside our body. You know, you inhale oxygen, it becomes carbon react with oxygen, you become carbon dioxide. What's, what reaction it is? I was thinking oxidation and reduction reactions. Exactly. So um, all bio biological process, most of them, 99% are redox reactions. So so for redox reaction, what do you need? You you have you got to have some source of electrons. Somebody has to also be the, the, the reactor which takes the electrons away. So you got to have oxidation reaction, you have to have redox reactions. So here you have only things is organic carbon. So it gives electrons or take electron based on whichever uh, functional group, but something has to give the electrons, right? So you got to have an oxidant. Uh, so that's usually oxygen or nitrate or some electron acceptor or donor, right? So, so what could be that one? So you have to think of that. Right, so they have only organic pollutant. So that means you got to inject that. If it is not, um, um, if it is permanganate, that's basically oxidation reaction. So you're injecting that. Okay, so this is electron acceptor, that's donor. So all combined. Uh, but if it's bioremediation, you have to give that electron donor or acceptor. So that's 
sometimes is oxygen. So that means you have to you have to spray oxygen or inject air through the uh, through the system uh, so that the reaction is high. And for bioremediation, temperature is critical, right? So you got to find a way to heat up or warm it uh, so that the efficiency is high. Why it is important? Because it's a it helps every day this site is not being used, the owner is losing money, right? So time is money. Uh, so if you, if you say that I'm going to clean it up in three years, they save millions of dollars in that every one year they don't have this site used for something else. So bioremediation is slow. That means you have to find a way to uh, make it fast. So these are the different things you have to think of. Any other? <clears throat> Let's, see, let's learn from one thing, no? carbon absorption. It's not going to work because it's not water, right? So you have to pump and take that water out and then clean it. And you are hoping that this water is going to somehow dissolve all the pollutants. Uh, this is true as long as this is small amount of pollutants because desertion is slow. Uh, and then you have to pump, it's expensive. So you can't apply that one. And you learn air stripping, that's again groundwater. And the, if it is volatile, it's all, always is very easy to ex escape from to air by just pumping pumping air through it. If you pump air through it, you know any volatile pollutants so is going to escape very easily, or warm the soil, uh, so that will be easier to es make them escape. So you don't need to have a pump and treat. And next, in situ technology, you learn advanced oxidation, which is a said that you can do it. And then Richard, you also discuss about typically bioremediations. And then also phytoremediations, right? So you, you don't have to do just bioremediations because phytoremediation can work, but you know that phytoremediation is extremely slow process for the plant to grow and then herb is not efficient. So that's why in this case, you can't apply that because uh, you need time, right? So the time is important here. Um, this is, a, this is a, like something has to be done quicker. Um, so those are the different concepts. So I'm going to share with you the slides that we propose, okay, with a professor in material science. Um, this is what we proposed, okay. So as you see over here, um, we said that we are not going to dig the soil, okay. The reason we don't want to dig the soil is it's expensive. You have to sleep somewhere. It's acre of acre land. In other words, we are going to destroy that all pollutant by burning it. So how do you burn it? You have to heat it up. But here, instead of heating up the, this is the newer technology. So you can use solar energy. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a magnifying glass, right? So you, it concentrates the solar cell and project the light, the energy into that very small area. So it's, it goes to the very extremely high temperatures, like as, as high as almost like near sun. So it flushes, it's burn it very quickly. And so what they can do is they can put this lens on a, on a trailer and then just move around and just do like a, like burning that top layer, top of soil, basically hitting that soil very high. So that means you can destroy that, that, uh, that carbon because of flask carbonization. So that means you are creating not a byproduct, you are creating the, the carbon dioxide, not like a toxic fume. So this is the technique just to, we don't know that that's how it works. We just propose so that we can see as a pilot scale. So the idea is that you remove that top soil layer and, and destroy those and then you scrape it off and then do it again. So as long as you take care of this top soil, um, then you destroy, you kind of you know, remove those, the heavily polluted. And then you wanted to increase the reaction very fast. And as I said, to deliver the, uh, electron donor acceptor, it takes time. So you, what you can do is you can directly deliver the electrons instead of having a reactants that produce the electron and then go there. You can deliver the electron or take the electron away by directly using conductor, okay? Because this soil is near ocean, it is highly salty, right? So you have lots of iron, that means you have conducting power. So you don't have to worry about uh, charge conduction. So that means if you put these electrodes space close to each other and apply uh, electric energy, that can accelerate directly, you know, uh, vertically can destroy by giving the electron. Also, it helps also microbe to do it faster. And these electrons can come from power source like solar panel. 
So this is very much, you know, you are using solar energy to destroy the reactions faster. So this is something we propose, you know, we see whether they, they accept our proposal or not. Uh, this is just to get a concept that how we can apply. Uh, once you know what is the, the location challenge, you can start doing it, everything else. Uh, so by the way, you guys come up with the solutions of uh, oxidants. These are not paired solutions. These are also complementary solution to that. Uh, so uh, when finally people do, they do like different pilot for different process and they see how much cost, which one is effective. Because ultimately the cost here is the time. Right? So, uh, so this is what we propose and we, we discuss, we'll see how it goes, but then COVID happened. Otherwise we would have learned about what could be done. So as you see, um, there are in many opportunity for you to get involved uh, for different type of projects and actually learn what, apply what you learned in this class. Many of the consulting company for remediation doesn't require more than what you already know in this class. Right? That's, this is where you can start. And obviously you, then you become specialized in one area. You will become specialized either modeling, groundwater modeling, or you can specialize in concept development like this, how I, we, what you did in this class. There are multiple things. So this is all you need. Obviously, if you take graduate level class, you'll more become more familiar with uh, more expert in this specific area. Uh, so many remediation company requires you to have a master degree uh, to, to go to higher level. It doesn't mean that you can, you can join as undergrad and then you come work for a few years and then come back and do masters. So um, again, I, I just hope that if this is a line that you wanted to pursue, then you should, uh, you should start thinking of a company for internship in, in summer in this area. And you can use your uh, projects as a, as a report to, to describe that during interview. You could say that this is something I worked on. And uh, because unlike typical class where you write report, you give it to the instructor and the instructor uh, grade it and final done. No, here is a feedback process. So this is how actually things happen in a company. Not, I mean, this is still very uh, crude way. It's not like, you know, you got to do much more details, but still you got the idea about how to uh, work together as a team, uh, you learn some concept, you apply that you brainstorm the solutions on your own um, and you, you come up with the cost and all that aspect of it. So this is what it's needed. All right, so I think that's all for the class today. And I, as I said, I, um, uh, there is a in-situ biomedicine, but it would be too salty. So salt is not a problem. There are some, that's why I say you are not using the, bacteria which is not from outside. You are using the same bacteria which is evolved to be there. Ocean has bacteria, right? So they, are, they live there, learn to live. So you're not going to take different bacteria and inject it there. That, well, that's what it means. Um, okay, well, next class you know, will be our, uh, in technically it will be the last class in the sense the, the first day we'll have presentation. So we'll see what the presentation together discuss about it. So, so technically to next class Monday is our last class as far as interactions in the sense that that day come to the class and come up with questions about career, anything. It's more like a, um, no, there's no, no agenda there. Okay. And if you don't have any question, we'll just leave in 30 minutes. So it's not, there's no obligation to sit around till 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Okay. We are done with the um, syllabus and because this is COVID time, it is also advantage because if I didn't finish something, I always record and so some some lectures are more than two two hour and that's the reason why it got done faster. In class, sometimes you know you don't you don't have options. You know you done one and one hour fifty minutes and then you come back next class. Uh, so I mean we cover everything that we need to cover. So we have one extra class. I hope that class will be more like a discussion about what we learn and maybe, you know, we can learn together what works well, be more brutally honest about what didn't work, you know. At least you know, I, I'm, I'm not the person who will sigh away saying how bad I felt the, during the last quarter of uh, different things I struggle. And the reason is I want to say that I want to normalize that you should not be perfect. You don't have to do 100% right, you know, every time it's not easy. Um, 
okay all right so we'll see you next class uh, i'll stop recording now um, uh, good luck for your quiz this will be released around 7 pm uh, if it is 5 minutes late don't worry it will still show up uh, sometimes when things doesn't work i i do recheck again um, so but otherwise you you have whole tomorrow and by in any chance you know if you delay you know just let me know i'll extend it but once you open you have 20 minutes okay okay all right see you on monday and good luck for your um, presentation as well as draft report